morning, church. We're so grateful to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. We are here to worship him. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. We'd like to invite you this morning to join us as we shout praise to the Lord, as we sing praise to the Lord, as we lift up a song of praise to the Lord. Hallelujah.
Father's Day, everybody. Pastor Stephen Wilkes, I'm going to invite you to share a scripture. Pray over everybody as we get into worship today. All right, man, this is from Psalms 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him, for he will rescue you from every trap. He will protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you from his feathers and he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Amen. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night nor the arrows that fly in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness nor the disaster that strikes in the midday. Though a thousand fall at your side and though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. Men, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near you and no plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you men wherever you go. They will hold up your hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And you will trample upon lions and cobras. You will, fierce, you will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue, rescue those men who love me. I will protect those who trust you and call on my name. And when men, when you call on the name of the Lord, he will answer. He says he will be with you in trouble and he will rescue and honor them. And he will reward you with a long life and give them my salvation. Lord, I pray over these men, Lord God, these leaders, Lord God, these men that are called, that have a calling on their life to lead, Lord God. Lord, to lead their children, Lord, to lead their houses, to lead their spouses, Lord God, to lead their job sites, Lord God, to lead their places where they interact with, Lord God, because of what you put in them, Lord God. You are the light, and that light has been with, put within them, Lord God. So I pray, Lord God, that they use this light, Lord God, for everything they need for the world around them has already been put within them with you, Lord God. Bless these men, Lord God. Bless them on this Father's Day. Let them be honored, Lord God. Let them teach their kids about honoring, Lord God. And let these men lead in honoring their families, Lord God, as we give praise to you, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Judge and our defender suffered and crucified. 
virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again
sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. With all creation sing praise to the King of Kings. Yes, you are my everything, and I will adore you. says come to me all of you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest and I just pray today that the Lord would meet you where you are at if you're here today and you're carrying a burden will you just lift your hands in front of you just to say here I am Lord and I'm carrying a burden today I pray Lord that those with their hands lifted God that you would make their burden light they come to you. Come to me, all of you who are here, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Give them rest. Give them peace today in the middle of their situation. You see it. I do not. Give them a peace. Meet them with your peace where they're at today, Lord. Fill them with their peace, Lord Jesus, where they're at today. God, meet them where they are. Meet them where they are. I'm just going to give a few seconds. Just let the presence of God move in this place. Come on, just dig into the presence of God just for a moment. King of kings. 
Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Hallelujah. Can you give him praise this morning all over this place? We give you all praise. We welcome your presence here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We welcome your presence in this place, God. Do what you want in our lives. In the powerful name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can be seated this morning. And as you do so, um, everybody our mexico team has returned most of them there's still a few on the road and i want to i want to honor you guys you guys did a great job this week building the house a mexico team if you went to mexico will you stand um all of you that went to mexico and let's give them a huge huge hand they got the house built they ministered to the family and it, they have a video that they brought back that they'd like to share with you guys you can be seated Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Your church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts release the hurt, the sick, the poor. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause We are your church We pray revive this earth Build your kingdom Am I on? There we go. You got to hear me today. I don't want you to not hear me. How cool is that? I mean, that, those, those families, their lives are changed forever. The, the family we built for last year, um, it changed their, their lives completely. When we went back in December, because she had a home and she was able to get stability, she was able to get her, her daughter's glasses, who needed glasses. It, it just changes everything for them. They went back this year. The home we built last year, she had put a watermelon farm around her house, and so now she has watermelons to sell. How cool is that? Like, it changes everything for them. And, and so thank you. Those that, have get, that gave, a lot of you gave for this to be able to happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. That family and her children, their lives are changed forever. Um, we do make this a yearly trip if you want to go next year. The cool thing about this trip is you can bring your kids, you can bring your family. It's a good family 
trip. It's not just a trip that's really hard and just adults only. Um, so you can, you can do that. So you'll see stuff. We'll probably do it about the same time frame next year, all right? You can turn with me to Colossians chapter 3 today in your Bible's devices. I also handed out a sheet. Um, you can put it up there on the screen. That's what my sheet looked like today I, um, at the end of my study. And I, I wanted to show that to you because you can do that with yours. Like, there's three boxes you might want to build and some sketching you might want to do, and you'll see that come together as we go through the message, and we are going to have some fun today. The first thing I'm going to do, we're going to get a little crazy today, okay? Just a little bit crazy. It's going to get a little chaotic and a little bit crazy, and I'm going to push the envelope with you today. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I'm going to make all of you guys uncomfortable, okay? And I'm going to have all the ladies, it's going to get really interesting. I'm going to have all the ladies go to the sides and I want all the men to sit right here in the middle. I'm pulling you away from your wife today, mainly because I don't want you to get in trouble, okay? So all the men, all your boys, all the men, all girls, women, get out of the middle section, okay? Because I'm going to, I'm going to give it to your, I'm going to give it to your husband today and I don't want you elbowing them, all right? So we're going to, a little chaotic, we're going to make this happen. This is going to be fun. Um, those, there we go. All right. Some of you feel real uncomfortable. You've never not sat by your spouse in church, okay? It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay, guys. Okay, you'll be fine. All right. Okay, still have some of you guys in the back there. You're not going to be able to sit in the back now. You're going to have to come up here in the front, okay? It's going to get a little uncomfortable, and we're going to get in each other's face a little bit, and... While you're doing that, all of you ladies, um, you're still invited. You can listen in, okay? And I think you might get something out of it today. What I'm going to do today, I, I promise you, if you will do some of the things that I'm talking about, it will change your family. It'll change your life. It will change everything. I, I'm, I make that promise today, okay? So you guys here, if you will apply some of the stuff I'm going to give you today, it will change your life. It'll change everything. It'll change your family, okay? Are you guys okay? Everyone all right? Okay. All right. I got, this is kind of cool. We should do this. There's some churches that do this every week. <laughs> Maybe we should just do that. All right. So Colossians chapter three. So um, I've got two gifts for you. The first one is in the form of a dad's root beer, and we're going to start distributing it that right now. And look at what I did for you guys. Everybody's in the middle here. That's going to make it easy, and they're going to hand you a dad's root beer. Do not open it yet. We're going to open it at the end, okay? So do not open it. Hold on to it, and at the end, we will open it. So that's the first gift for you. The second gift for you is in the form of a scripture verse, if you see your outline there, okay? In the form of a scripture verse, and it's this. Wives, submit to your husbands. That's your second gift. <laughs> and that's why I put you in, so she's not elbowing you. You're not elbowing her, all right? Wives, I actually practiced how I would say that this week, because inflection, voice inflection is everything when you say that. Is it, wives, submit to your husbands, or is it, wives, submit to your husbands, all right? You can go either way. So I'm going to go with the second one, uh, maybe the first one. Wives, submit to your husbands. See, husbands, turn to your wives right now and look at them and say, submit. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. All right. All right. And then it says, as it is fitting to the Lord. And then it says this, okay? Husbands, love your, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I, I promise you, ladies, you're going to love me at the end of this, okay? You're going you're gonna to love me. And you're going to love, this is going to become one of your favorite passages. I know that that's hard for some ladies. This is going to become one of your favorite passages. Children, obey your parents. I think we can all say amen on that one, right? Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are earthly masters, not by way of eye service or people pleasers. So don't just do it just to be seen, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. This is actually one of my favorite verses in the Bible right here. Whatever you do, work heartedly as for the Lord and not for men. This is part that will change your life right here. If you get this verse, okay, it'll change everything. Whatever you do, everything you do in your life, do it with all of your heart. Why? Because you're doing it to the Lord and not for, for men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we're skipping. We were in chapter one. Now we're skipping to chapter three. Why? Because it is Father's Day. So all of our minds are on our families. Because family is very, very important. Your home is very, very important, especially 
for the Christian, the Christian home. The, it should be the focus of the, of the believer's life. Your home is important. You see, what happens in your home is a reflection of what has already happened in your heart. Men, what happens in your home is a reflection of what has happened in your, in your heart. It validates what has happened in your heart. The other way to put it is this. What God has done in your heart must be reflected in your home. Okay, so what you have had God do in your heart, a lot of you have great testimonies. You women have great testimonies. All of that should come to bear in your home. It should be reflected in your home and how you operate. I I love the quote, um, success is when those who are closest to you respect you the most. Sitting here today, you might say, man, I respect my pastor. That's great. But you know what really matters? Does my wife respect me? Do my kids respect me? That, that's success. Success is when those that are closest to you respect you the most. So who you are on the inside better play out in your, in your, in your home. So we skip from chapter one to chapter three. In Colossians three, Paul is addressing a clash. It's a clash that has happened between the Roman culture and the Christian life. And it's playing out in the homes of the Colossian Christians. This is at the heart of the clash. How do I be a man? How do I be a husband? How do I be a dad? Not just that. How do I be a godly, a Christian man, husband, and dad in a Roman world? I mean, I've been saved. I've done all the right stuff. But no matter how hard I try, I am still Roman at heart. I was raised Roman. The Roman culture is in me. I'm saved, but I didn't lose my Romanness. Okay, it's still inside of me. I still have Roman instincts. I still have the, the Roman way of doing things. I think like a Roman. All of us deal with this when it comes to our Christian walk. All of you men deal with this when it comes to your Christian walk because you were raised in different cultures. You were raised in different homes. You had different parents. You had a lot of things happen in your, in your life and in, in your family. It all clashes. It all comes to bear in your family. Um, the who you were and your culture and your home that you were raised in is deep inside of you for the good and for the bad. How many of you know there's two things you learn from your parents? You learn what you want to do and who you want to be, and you learn who you don't want to be. Those two things are learned from your parents, and you bring all of that inside of you to your home. And the moment you give your life to the Lord, it'd be nice if all left, but it, it does not, and it clashes in our homes. The culture that you were raised in and Christianity is a clash. And this is how it surfaces, okay? This is how the culture that you bring with you surfaces. It surfaces in this way. How do you treat your wife? That's where it surfaces. All of that stuff comes to bear in how you treat your wife and how you treat your kids and in how you treat what you have to do every day. Sometimes we call it a job, okay? How you treat those things, all the things inside of you come to bear in those, in those moments. So chapter three, The first 18 verses talks about new life, and then it talks about how it plays out in this Roman household, okay, when the cultures clash. And there's three sections. I'm going to spend most of my time, and I'm addressing you men, but you get, ladies get to listen. I'm going to spend most of my time on section one, and then, which, is, which is your relationship with your wife. And then we're going to move into your relationship with your kids, and then your relationship with your plight in life, okay? So that's what we're going to do. But when I do number one, it's going to take like 15 minutes. The others will take about five minutes, okay? So don't think you're going to be here for an hour. We'll, we'll get done in, a, in the next 20, 25 minutes, okay? So first of all, your relationship with your wife. What does this scripture say? It says, wives... Submit to your husbands, and it's fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. It's interesting to me in the scripture that there's one command given to the woman, and there's two to the husband. You've got a lot of responsibility when it comes to your, your spouse. Men often, and for decades, for centuries, have celebrated this verse. Women have struggled with this verse. Why? Because it's been abused. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of abuse that has been brought to this, this verse. And this verse, because of that, when I read this verse, it brings a lot of emotions in. Everybody brings some emotions to this verse, okay? And, so, and that's why I separated you so that your wife doesn't give this to you, okay? Um, it, it brings a lot of emotions. So this verse, it requires a change of perspective, and that's what I want to give you today. I want to give you a change of perspective. There's this rock in Rio de Janeiro. I've been to this rock. It's kind of a cool place if you'll put that picture up there, Okay. 
I hate this place. I hate these types of pictures, and I hate seeing these things happen. But this is a place where people go and do this kind of stuff, and it's way above the landscape of Rio. And so you go there, you see these crazy teenagers, these crazy young people, never us older people because we've gotten too wise, right, to do this kind of stuff. And there's a reason why we've made it to our age. And <laughs> so you see them doing all of this stuff, and it blows you away. You're like, how could they do this? When you see these pictures, it blows you away. It's your perspective. But listen... If you zoom out, this is the next, what you actually see right here, okay? That's what you actually see. It's the angle. <laughs> it's the angle of the camera. It's not really like that. It's the perspective, right? When you zoom out, you get a different perspective, and that's what's going to happen today when you look at this verse. One of the reasons why I brought you men forward is because I want you to see my whiteboard, and I know it's a little harder on the, on the outsides, okay? So what I want to do is I want to help you with your perspective on this, on this crazy verse, okay? So down here, first of all, um, on the bottom here, and this is where the graphs come in on that, you've got, I'm gonna write here, first century, okay, first century Roman woman, okay? So you have the first century Roman woman right here. So in order for us to understand that, we have to understand a little bit for us to get this passage and change our perspective about the first century Roman woman. First of all, they were not equal to men, okay? They were not equal to men. They were not even full citizens. They were citizens through their husband or through their, their father. So really, you could see the Roman woman as a half, a half citizen, okay? They, their value and their influence was only determined by who they married. So there was no place in society for them apart from their spouse. Everything was through their spouse or through their father, do you know what this created? The women, which some of you are too, um, the Roman women became excellent influencers. They controlled a lot of Rome through their husbands because they knew how to influence their husbands. So we have this crazy dynamic that they weren't even seen as full citizens, yet they were able to influence their, their husbands in a great way. By the way, you still influence your husband today. Okay? And your husbands influence you. It's an important part of your marriage how you're influencing each other. The third thing is they didn't have the right to their own name. So they took their dad's name with a female prefix on the, on the end of it. So their identity was directly tied to their, their father. They were married off as young teenagers, some as young as 12, and, um, and their dad would choose their spouse, and the spouse was often much older. Why would they choose older men? Because they had more money for the dowry. So they would basically be selling their daughters off for the dowry that they would, they would get. Um, they could not, women could not vote. They had no rights as citizens, and they had no, no voice in any decisions. They were not allowed to be involved in politics at all or to serve in the military. So this is the, the, the first century Roman woman that Paul is addressing here. Now, I want you to hear what some leading voices of the day said about women. So these are some ancient manuscripts about the women, men writing about the women in ancient Rome. And I'm, I'm not saying these things. I'm reading these things, okay? So don't get mad at me. Get mad at the Romans, okay? <laughs> Listen to what Cecilio, the, the Roman politician, said. Women must, imagine running on this platform, because he ran on this platform. Women must have guardians because of their weak judgment, Okay? This is how the Romans saw the first century Roman woman. The other one, and they get worse, okay? Marcus Cato, a statesman, said this. Don't treat women as your equal because from that moment on, they will become your superior. That's how they saw women. You don't treat them as your equal because the moment you do, they'll be your superior. This one's going to make you very uncomfortable. Um, his name is Juvenal. He's a historian and a poet, and he wrote, Women are prone to promiscuity. Most annoying when they dare to flaunt their intellectual opinions. Remember, this is what I'm writing. I didn't say in this stuff. And then he says this, heaven help the man whose mother-in-law still has a pulse. Okay, that's why I put you guys separate. So there's no amens there, okay? All right. <laughs> all, all chance of domestic harmony is lost when your mother-in-law is still alive. I, I want... I want you to, I, I'm trying to give you a little bit of perspective of what Paul was dealing with here. In the Roman culture, women were devalued, oppressed, and even abused. Perspective, okay? Now I want to do this. Up here, okay, up here we're going to put the 21st century American woman. American woman, stay away from me. All right. <laughs> That wasn't even in my notes. That was good, wasn't it? Right there. 21st. Now, this, this, you guys are not, 
you, you guys are not the first century Roman woman. A lot has changed. As a matter of fact, when you hear about this, it's appalling to you, unthinkable, offensive, unimaginable to you. Unfortunately, there are still are places in the world that is like this. Uh, I've been to them. There's a lot of places that it's like, like that still. Um, in, in the United States of America, you are seen as equal. You have your own identity. You get to marry who you want to marry. You're valued not because of your man. You're valued on your man, um, on your own, and you get to vote. And you could be president of the United States. Ladies, I would vote for Mona any day in this next election. I'll tell you that right now. I'll vote for you, any, any one of you ladies, all right? I'll tell you what. You guys are not the first century Roman woman. So what, is, what does Paul do here, okay? This is where it's going to get, we're going to change perspective here. What does Paul do? He tells these people, first century, he said, you got to do a few things. You've got to submit, ladies, submit. And then he says two things to the men. you got to love and not embitter, okay? Not embitter your wife. So he says, you've got to do these three, three things. You've got to submit, and then men, you've got to love, and you've got to not embitter your, your spouse. So I want to take a minute, and I want to talk about these three words. Because what is happening here, see, when you look at this verse, a lot of times you do this. You're like, well, doesn't that lower? I feel like that lowered us. But what was Paul really doing here? Boy, I tell you what, Paul was elevating women. He was elevating them out of a place where they'd been dehumanized. Let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus was a great feminist, okay? You might look and say, that's a dirty word. We wouldn't use that for Jesus. No, Jesus lifted up women. He freed women. He went after women. He talked to women that people would not normally talk to, and he cared about women. Why? Because Jesus elevated all of humanity. And what is Paul doing here? He is elevating the first century woman. Now, let's take a minute, and let's look at these words, the word submit. All of us should be under authority. If you're not under authority, listen to me, guys. If you have no authority in your life, you are in a dangerous place. If there's nobody that can tell you that's a stupid decision, you're in a very dangerous place in your life. You've got to have, I don't care who you are, you better have authority over you, authority in your life. Hebrews 13 says, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep a watch over your souls as one that will give account. I, I'm the pastor of this church, so I have authority over me outside of this church. I've got my, I'm so thankful I've got a dad that's still alive. My dad can look at me and say, that's really stupid. Don't, you don't want to do that. My dad can. Also, I have a superintendent who is my pastor, and he can look at me, and he can call me on things, and he could rebuke me, and he can speak into my life. I have authority in my life. Now, this is important for you to understand about this. This is going to change everything for you. That word submit. That word submit. What does it mean? In the Greek, it means to subject oneself, to be voluntarily subject. Voluntarily I, vol- I voluntarily subject myself to the superintendent as my, as my pastor. He is my authority. It's a voluntary thing. This word, and it's been so abused, it does not mean to subjugate. It does not mean to be forced. It doesn't mean to submit. Listen to me. It doesn't mean that you need to submit to abuse. You should never, ladies, submit to an abusive relationship. It doesn't mean, this word submit does not mean that you are less than It doesn't mean you have less value. It doesn't mean you're incapable. It doesn't mean you're anybody's doormat. And it doesn't mean you're anybody's slave. That's not what this word means. By the way, men, this word submit cannot be forced. I I joked and said, look at your wife and say, submit to me. If If you do that to your wife, you have just moved out of scriptural authority. It is, a, it is a voluntary submission that takes place to the authority of somebody else. Never forced. Listen, to submit is a response. I want you to hear me today. It's a response. Follow me. Now we're going to go to the next two words. It's a response to two things. Love. Agapeo is the word for love. Agapeo. Guys, hear me. Agapeo. It means the highest form of love. It is a selfless love. Paul, he He elaborates in Ephesians 5.28 on this kind of love. He says that you should love your wife as yourself. That's a lot of love because some of you like yourself a whole lot, okay? (laughs) You like yourself a lot. That's a lot. What would happen if you loved your wife more than you loved yourself? What would happen? I told you ladies you'd like me. What would happen (laughs) if you cared for your wife, guys, listen, more than you cared for yourself? It would change everything in your relationship. And then he adds to it in verse 25. He says, you should love your wife as Christ loved the church. 
What did Christ do for the church? It tells us there, he gave himself for the church. You should put your wife above you. You should be willing to die for your wife. You guys would say, of course I am. I would die for my wife. Yeah, but will you give up your rights for your wife? Will you give up your desires for your wife? Will you give up your right to be right all the time? (laughs) Will you give up your pride? Come on, I want to speak deep to the hearts of people today. Will you give up those rights for your, for, your, for your wife? Well, she's the one that's supposed to submit. Yeah, but you're supposed to, you're supposed to love. See, the submission is a, re- is a response to this kind of love. A love that doesn't exist will not, re- be, there will be no response of submission that will exist. Then it says this, it adds, it says this, don't embitter your wife or the English Standard Version that I have up there says, don't be harsh with your wife or don't embitter them. That word embitter means to make something turn sour. Some of you guys, your wife was very sweet when she met you and you turned her sour because of the way you treat her. Let me tell you what, I I think if you were to put this in modern day language in my translation, it would say, be nice to your wife. Be nice. I can't tell you how many times I sit in counseling and I'm like, dude, If you would just be nice to your wife, you would start winning. Just be nice, but you're so grumpy. You're so hard. You're having such a hard time. Just be nice to your wife. And when you do that, let me tell you, it will change everything. So what does Paul do? See, I want to change your perspective. What does Paul do for the first century Roman woman? He elevates her, he frees her, and he empowers her. That's what he does. For, for the first century woman. Now I want to talk to you men, okay? I want to talk to you husbands. This is what you should be doing for your wife. You should be elevating your wife. You should be, every chance you get, you should be lifting your wife up, adding value to your wife. Some of you ladies, you want to say, man, I'm not married yet. Find this kind of man, okay? He's not going to change for you. Find this kind of man when, he's, when you're dating him. Lifts you up, adds value sees her as, as God's creation before something that belongs to him, wants her to be all that God created her to be. My, my wife just ran the Mexico trip. I'm so proud of her for doing that. Why? Because I believe she could do it. I believe that my wife is better than me and she can do more than me and she's got God's call on her life. It's not just God's call on my life and my wife is tagging along. Hear me today, my, my wife has a call on her own life. And do you know what success is for me? When I can see her walk in that, when I can elevate her, when I can, when I can encourage her. So you've got to empower your wife. You've got to free your wife. Be busy finding the things in her life that are broken and being a conduit of healing. Too many times husbands do damage when you should really be freeing your wife. You should be freeing her from hurts in her life. So you need to elevate, you need to free, and you need to empower her. You need to give her every tool and every resource to flourish. What would happen to your marriage, guys, if instead of this, you must submit to me, you're in the middle of a decision, you must submit. What would happen if instead you lived a lifestyle of I agape you? I put you first in everything. I elevate you. I free you. I empower you. What would happen if your wife saw that and your goal was for your wife to excel and to be lifted up? Do you know what would happen? Your wife over here would want to partner with you in that. And if she partnered you with you in that, do you know what she would be willing to do? She'd be willing to submit to your authority in the home. Too many guys, we say, you got to submit to my authority. If, if you submitted, then, my, then our home would be right. No, you love your wife. You lift her up. You're nice to her, and then she will fall and say, listen, I will submit to that kind of authority. And then your life, stop worrying so much about your wife submitting and start worrying about you loving. Amen. Come on, I, I, let me hear a man from the ladies on that, all right? Now we can hear an amen from the guys, because I know that you guys agree, Amen. All right, now we're going to go to the next one. I told you that's going to be the big one, okay? We're not going to be as heavy now, okay? Section number two, your relationship with your kids. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged, okay? It's the same exact thing that is happening here. I'm not going to write out the names, but you've got the first century Roman child down here. The first century Roman child. What do we find out about them if you start reading? First of all, when the baby was born into a family, they did not touch that baby. It laid on the ground. 
then somebody would come and they would, they would examine the baby and make sure that baby was perfect and had no defects and looked like they wanted it to look. And then they would pick it up and that's when it was accepted into the family. If there was any defects, that baby was left on the ground to die. You might say, wow, that's unbelievable. It still happens in places in this world. When I was in Calcutta, I met a young kid that was abandoned outside his, outside his house in a dump because he had a cleft lip. It still happens today. This is how Roman children were treated. The other thing is the father had the right to beat them, to torture them, even to sell them to, or to kill them or to sell them if they angered him. That's the first century Roman child. Then we have up here, we have the 21st century American child with their iPods and their iPhones and their nice, whatever those things you roll on, where you roll on them, right? The shoes you can roll on. They got all that stuff. And Heelys, thank you. They have rights. And they, for the most part, are cared for, not everywhere. There are kids that are an exception to that, which is sad. They're protected. Um, if they have a handicap, they're not left there to die. We value our kids. We see, friends, as Christians, we see our kids as a treasure. Do you know why? Because they are. Your kids are, are a treasure that God has given to you. I went to a church once, and I was there for a while, and um, they were not nice to kids. And if a kid went on the stage, they would get yelled at, not by the parent, but the pastor would yell at them, get off my stage, you're gonna break my stuff. Do you know how expensive that stuff is? Do you know what I like in this church? I like when our kids come up here and dance. Do you know why? I like, and do you know why? Because our kids are more important than our stupid stage, okay? Listen, we've gotta be a church that values. We, one, of our, one of the core values of River City Church is we honor you don't just honor a lot of places that's like, oh, you honor the pastor. No, we honor everybody. We honor our children from the youngest to our seniors and the oldest. You value people. And what does Paul do for the first century, the first century child that had no rights and was treated as property? He elevates them. And what does he tell them to do? He says, obey, okay? Yeah, okay, obey. You need to obey your parents. But then he says, hey, listen, you gotta be, you, you, what's the word there they use there? Someone help me. What does he say to the parents? Do not provoke, okay? Submit. No, the parents don't submit. Come on, Judah, okay? <laughs> Do not provoke. <laughs> parents, submit. Children, obey. For you submit to your kids, right? <laughs> All right, so kids, you obey. Now, this is, you got to follow me. This is a variation of the word submit. It's a different Greek word, and it means you must obey. You have to obey. Obey it implies no choice. Parents, you have authority over your children. Please, for the Lord's sake, make your kids obey. Do you know why? They'll thank you later. <laughs> they will thank you later for being, being that hand in their life, being that person that, that guides them. Make your kids obey. But this is where he elevates children because he doesn't say you have no rights. He says then parents, do not provoke. That word means, in the, in the Greek, it means do not nag. Do not belittle them. And do not make them resent you and do not provoke your children. One of the commentators I wrote, he said, all, and this word has implied some things. And, and he wrote this list and I'm going to give it to you. In this word, this is how this plays out. Do not devalue your children. I don't know if you ever heard somebody say, man, you're stupid to your kid. I, I, I had kids that I had in my life when I was a youth pastor whose parents told them, you are a mistake. We should have never had you. Do not devalue your kids. Watch the things you speak to your kids. Don't tell them they're stupid. Don't, I know it's hard sometimes, man, when you're mad and your kid does something stupid, okay? That was stupid, but they're not stupid. Don't devalue your kid. Don't deprive them of affection. That can be hard for men to deprive, to, to be affectionate towards your kids. Do not criticize them. I hate it when somebody walk, somebody's kid walks away and they go, oh, my kid's a pain in the butt. They're such a turd. Man, he's so annoying. I've seen this stuff. Don't criticize your kids. Don't neglect your kids. Um, it says neglecting them financially with your time. The, the guy said don't, don't um, have excessive discipline and don't have no discipline. Provide a standard in your home. So men, this is what you should, you should be doing for your children. You need to value your children and still value in them. The world is busy tearing your kids down. You need to be speaking life into your kids. You need to find every little place that you can speak life. You know, I always 
raising my kids, I always think every time I discipline my kid, I'm giving away like some coinage to them. And I've got to, every time I compliment them, I'm putting coinage in my pocket. So I better have enough coin in my pocket that when they need to be disciplined, I have some to pay out without being bankrupt. Does that make sense to you? I, I, I want to compliment my kids 10 times for every time I have to discipline them. Be speaking life into your kids. Show affection, affection to your kids. Build your kids up. Find every reason to praise them and then prioritize them. Don't prioritize TV and sports and video games for the Lord's sake. Do not prioritize video games when you've got a little baby in your house. You need to prioritize your, your children. You are a dad. And everything you do, come on, hear me somebody today. This is real practical stuff. You need to have your child alongside of you. Do life with your kids next to you. If you're gonna watch TV, do it with your kid next to you. If you're gonna play some video games, do it with your kids next to you. Do life with your kid next to you and then discipline them correctly. And do you know what you will get in return? A pliable child that wants to obey you. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why? Because there is sinful flesh. But hey, I tell you what, you'll be, you'll be fighting the battle correctly if you do this. Section number three, and this will be the shortest. Your relationship with your plight. Bond servants, obey in everything. Those who are your earthly masters, do by, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that, the Lord, that for the Lord, from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, for you are serving the Lord. Okay, we have the same scenario here. He's addressing bond servants. That Greek word for bond servant is doulos, which is literally slave. So he's addressing, addressing slaves. Oftentimes they were property. They had no rights. Um, the time was not their own. They were either very underpaid or not paid at all. Legally, they could be, the slave could be killed by their owners. This plight was not desirable. They were the lowest of classes, and Paul addresses them. Then we have up here the 21st century American worker, okay? You've got rights. You are not a slave. Let me tell you what, you've got it good. You've got Kalosha. If you work at McDonald's, you still make how much an hour? 20 bucks an hour is required to work at McDonald's. That's why a Big Mac is like 40 bucks now, right? Okay, you've got all these rights. You, can, you have the right to time off and overtime. This is not a bad day to live, okay? This is a great day to live. So how does this apply to you when he's talking to 21st century slaves? Because some of you, you're doing all of this and you're still miserable, you still feel like a slave. You feel like your job is enslaving you. You're a slave to your job, and you go to work every day, and you hate your job. Guess what? Paul is talking to you. If you look at it here, he doesn't say anything to the owners. doesn't say anything. That he only addresses those that are in that slavery or for you feel like a slave to your job. What does he say? Obey. Now, back to that word. That word is the same word used for, for wives. Okay? It is to voluntarily subject yourself. And then he doesn't, like I said, he doesn't talk to the owners. He doesn't talk to the bosses. He doesn't give them any instructions. He just says, obey. And then he says, do it as to the Lord. Do it as to the Lord. This is, this is the part I see that will add a lot of value to your life. You work, okay? We're going to be done in 30 seconds. You work, but you serve the Lord. This changes perspective, okay? You work, yes, but when you work, do you know what you're actually doing as a believer? You should do it with all your heart because you know what you're actually doing? You're serving the Lord. So if you work real estate, guess what? You're doing real estate, but you're doing it as unto the Lord. If you do a physical job, okay, you do a physical, how many of you do a physical job? Like you pound nails, you do electricity, anybody here? Okay, we've got some, okay? You, you do a physical job. Listen, you might pound nails, but you do it unto the Lord. If you push paper every day, do it unto the Lord. If you run a business, do it unto the Lord. If you work for the state, you're not, you're not working for the state. You might be getting your paycheck for the state, but you do it as to the Lord. If you're here today and you're a teacher, we got a lot of teachers in the house. If you're a teacher, do you know what? You might teach for a living, but you do it where? Unto the Lord. You might be a nurse. We've got a lot of nurses in the house today. Guess what? You go and you care for people and you're doing that and you might be doing it for them, but you're also doing it unto, unto the Lord. 
Okay, now you can get the root beer, okay? Get the root beer, all you guys. Um, somebody, will you bring me a root beer? Mike, will you bring me a root beer? I mean, anyway, is there one for me? Look at they were on it. All right. Okay, guys, you can, you, why don't you guys all stand up, okay? I got you one place. Um, uh, okay, take the root beer. Okay, you can pop this off, pop the top off there, twist off. We're going to see how tough you actually are. And then you can go like this. Why? Because the women are going to pick them up later. <laughs> hey, I just did a lot for you ladies. I can make a joke. <laughs> You got it? Okay, all you tough guys. <laughs> you put it in your pocket, Josh. <laughs> I'm not throwing it down. I know better than that. I'm wiser than that, all right? Here, here, hey, here's the being a wise husband right here. Come on. All right, there's the being wise, right? All right, there we go. You're not throwing it down. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Well, I'm going to toast. We're going to do a toast to all you guys, okay? And then after we're done doing the toast, um, we're going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to do a song. And during that song, I want you to really just dig into the presence of the Lord and pray for your family. Okay, pray for your wife, pray for your kids, whatever is burdening your family. But first of all, a toast. Okay, so take those things and lift them up. Here's to our men. Here's to men who love their wives. Here's to men who elevate their wives. Here's to men who empower their wives. Here's to men who are nice to their wives, all right? Here's to men. Here's the men who value their children, who invest their lives in their children, who cry over their children, show affection to their children, build their children up, and are developing godly children. Here's the men who serve the Lord in everything that they do. Here's the men of River City Church. Amen. You can, you can clack somebody next to you. All right. All right. Worship team, I didn't have you come on up. Come on up, worship team. So, all right. You got it? Women, you get to watch us. It's non-alcoholic too, so it's church approved. Okay, here we go. But we're going to jump in. We're going to do a worship song. Ladies, you can stand with us today. And first, I want to pray over this great group of men. I'm thankful for a church. I've preached in churches where there's a man for every 10 women. I'm thankful for a church that is full of men, men that love the Lord, men that are, none of us are perfect, are we? Man, I tell you what, as I gotten older and I have a kid that's an adult who actually called me as I'm preaching and it said Okinawa across my thing, it kind of distracted me. I'm like, should I answer it? No, I'm not going to answer it, but <laughs> I should have. Um, as I've gotten older and he's left, I've thought, man, I've failed in so many ways. As a dad, we all face this. I've, I, all my failures, you know, I do the best I can, right? But at the end of the day, I trust the Lord with my family. I do the best I can as a husband, but at the end of the day, I trust the Lord. I do the best I can as a father, and I fail in a lot of ways, but at the end of the day, I don't fail as a husband, okay? But I fail as a dad. <laughs> I trust the Lord. And that's what we're going to sing today. We're going to sing about trusting the Lord, and then we're going to pray together, all right? Will you guys lead us? Thank you.
that will never fail. Even when I fail, He doesn't fail. change the words a little bit because I want you to seek the Lord right now trusting that he will answer you say I don't even know how to pray for my spouse just make her name on your lips put your kids names on your lips that's all you got to do just before the king
Let's seek the Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Courage, all right. So we, all, you can do that, and we'll receive it, all right? I just wanted to encourage all the men that we had a marriage of 62 years. Wow, and awesome. so, <laughs> That's awesome. Well, the way to work that out, number one, women, respect your husbands, okay? And husbands, I... My husband and I, we found, we met in high school, and we got married shortly after that. But in all our years, we found that if something came up, we'd take each other's hand, and we'd say, let's pray right now. And you don't wait, and you don't discuss it, because you go to the Lord first, Amen. and Amen. then he gives you the answers. So that song... You want to wait for his answers. He does answer. And so in all the years that we had, and our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, a lot of things come up. But you got to go together as partners and do it together with the Lord. Wow. wow. Stay right here with me, okay? Wow. Will you pray? Pray over, will you pray over the, the marriages and the children and just pray over our church? Okay. Loving and precious Lord, we just come before you with humble hearts. We thank you, Father, for who we are because of Jesus, that we can even come before your throne. And right now, Father, I just ask for your holy presence to just cover this whole room as you already have been, but just a precious wave over these people, Father, that the husbands and the wives can be united, that the young men and women that aren't married yet will have good relationships, Father, and work towards what you want them to do. And for all the little children, Father, we just pray your covering of protection and provision and that they will feel so precious and be able to uh, have the examples of their elders to walk forward in their lives that you have for all of your kingdom purposes. So, Father, we just lift it all up before you. We praise you. We give you all the honor that you are our living Lord, our creator, redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before you leave, because um, Sherry gives me these on Sundays sometimes, they're little notes. Because um, oftentimes I'm the lot, you're the last hug I get as I, by preaching goal. I come over here, I give you a hug, and then I come up here, and I always value that. I'm going to read this as the blessing over everyone because it's a great blessing over everybody. And she wrote it to me this morning. May the, may the favor of the Lord rest upon you, and may it establish the work of your hands. As a father, as a pastor, as a shepherd, may you be blessed for all of your faithfulness. Happy Father's Day. God bless you today. Yes, I'll